synchronizing. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Thank you, man. So today I'm going to give you, and I have a smaller audience, a presentation that I gave, and it's actually written in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, entitled The Cataract Situation in the Americans. I added on for the CRS meeting the haves and the have-nots, and you'll see why. I want to have a very special moment of thank you for Steve and for Nancy who have made this trip to the CRS so very special, and that uh, we yesterday went out just across the bridge from the Y and saw an elk where I could almost touch him, walk by the car, and then a doe with twins uh, milking from mom, and it's just been one of the most generous and phenomenal and exuberant uh, aspects of nature that I've seen and experienced in Estes Park. And I've learned so much from you. And uh, having those uh, lectures uh, from Jacob and on fast speed uh, M6 and what we heard about as uh, going on in Africa and all around the world and India has just been really phenomenal, including Diego's uh, resurgence. I don't see Diego right here from uh, Honduras. But Colorado has just been beautiful. We went to the Bear Lake yesterday, and uh, this the nature, the climate, the weather, the the uh, light was just at the perfect time. So let's get into business. There are so many ways that in which you can look at the cataract situation, and I'll try in a very brief presentation, I understand I have 25 minutes, to tell you about what is happening in Latin America. The Apostle John said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. And you'll see that much of what happens in Latin America has to do with the fact that the heart is many times in the wrong place. And there are people that have everything. They're very wealthy, they're very well off, but there's a majority of people that are very poor. But they're all in Latin America. There's a famous accident that occurred in Kenya off the Kikuyu Eye Camp. For those of you who know Alan Foster, he came out of the Institute of Ophthalmology in London. He had set up in Kikuyu uh, the only ophthalmology unit. There were six eye doctors for all of Kenya. I forget how many million people they had, but it was something like 60 or 70 million people. And they only had eight doctors doing, taking eye care. Soon enough, he realized that it was, the distances were such that he had to go from one camp to the other, and it would take almost a day's drive to do this, so he decided he would get an aircraft and set up three camps, and every weekend he would go to one of the three camps, and on the fourth weekend he would stay in the Kikuyu Eye Camp. And in one of those submissions after this was going on for two years, as the aircraft was taking off from one of the eye camps, the tail end of the uh, aircraft hit the uh, trees and the fuselage broke right behind his seat. All the equipment, all the materials that they had in those uh, back were empty, the fuselage empty, and it was all destroyed. Fortunately, no human loss. And uh, Alan meditated about this accident, and he went back to Kikuyu, and they had this old black guy who was sort of the uh, elder in the tribe, and he asked him in that typical British accent, oh man, what do you think about what I've done here in Kikuyu? I've been here now for six years. And the old man says, you, you're well intended, my son. You work very hard, but you accomplish very little. And he says, why is that, sir? Because if you had died in that airplane accident, we would have been back to having no eye doctors in Kenya because you haven't prepared anyone yet to replace you. So that made him change his mind, and Alan Foster, as you know, went on to back, go back and organize the Prevention of Blindness uh, Campaign Vision 2020. He became chairman later and CEO of CBM. He then became president of IAPD. And for the last 33 years, and he was my inspiration, I said, what we have to do is teach, 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 and train people, because we're not here forever, and somebody has to do the work that we have done. When we had our meeting at the Dominican Society of Ophthalmology only three weeks ago, the, my son was reading uh, all these old things about what I'd done and putting old pictures about my residents. And at one point he asked, well, of all the residents that are either graduates or are actively students or in the faculty of the Alliance in Santa stand up, and it was like half of the crowd had come out of our program. 
And where we were a minority years ago, now we are a majority. And therefore, education not only allows you to do a lot, it multiplies what you do. It's a multiplication effect. And here we go to another important concept that I got from Alan Foster, and it's called the barrel of blindness. For those of you who have seen it, this is the way that we explain CSR, or cataract surgery rate. In the top of the barrel is the backlog of cases that have operable cataracts. These are the patients that are blind from cataracts, and nobody's taken care of them yet. There's a little space through which you go called the cataract surgery rate. And then you can go into the bottom part of the barrel, which are those patients that effectively got the cataract operation and recovered sight. There are two little spigots to the side because you can get the cataract operation and not recover sight, of course, or you can die without having the surgery or die after you have had the surgery. The fact is that the, what regulates the amount of cataract surgery is the cataract surgery rate, and the recommended rate by the IAPD is 3,000 cataract operations per million population per year. So that's the number to remember. In most of Latin America 20 years ago, uh, just about every country was below that mean. That meant that the uh, uh, blindness rate was tremendous. Most of them are anywhere between 1.5 and 2 percent after the age of 50. If you do the whole population, is 0.5 percent. And these are busy slides, but the important thing is that the countries are actually doing something. The prevalence of blindness in the Dominican Republic, you see there in the center, is 2.1 percent. We were, not the low, we were not the highest, we were not the lowest. There are countries like Bolivia, Haiti, Nicaragua, Honduras, uh, and Guatemala that are doing worse. So we have classified them into the ABCDs. Those that are doing quite well have a rate of blindness 0.25, which happens to be the one in the United States of America. But if you're very poor, you're over 1%. And as, I, as you saw, we were nearly 2%. And we found that cataract surgery rate, and this is work done uh, uh, by Ibo Kokura of the IAPD, he correlated cataract surgery rates with literacy. The higher the literacy rate, the lower the, uh, the uh, prevalence of blindness, the higher the cataract surgery rate. Argentina does 5,500 cataracts per million per year. Uruguay and Chile are in that, book, in that boat. Most of the other countries are in more like uh, the Dominican Republic where we're doing about 3,000 at this point. But also, we correlate the cataract surgery rate to income. So the wealthier the country is, and this is worldwide, and you see America in uh, the highest uh, index in this map, in green. In blue, which is the highest in incidence or prevalence of cataract surgery, the higher cataract surgery rate is also in the United States, followed by Argentina, uh, Brazil, and then, interestingly enough, Barbados. Cuba has a very high cataract surgery rate as well. They also compare it to the Human Development Index. It's a complex index related to housing and education and the like. But the neat thing is, and I don't want you to, and, I mean, and this will be available for you, so let me try to read it. All the countries are actually doing better. The cataract surgery rate is going up. This slide is important for those who are doing mission trips because it's a reference. It tells you exactly how much they're charging for a cataract operation in each one of these countries. And this was hard work put together by Van Lansing, and it's something that you ought, ought to keep. But there are countries in the D category, Bolivia being one of them, Honduras, Nicaragua, Haiti, and Venezuela. If you go into the interior of the Dominican Republic, you get out of San Diego and Santo Domingo, we would be on the bad side as well. So that doesn't mean that the distribution of health care is quite equal. There's this interactive map that does the cataract surgery rate, and it's free in the Internet. If you go to the Vision 2020 IAPB site, and it'll do it by year, by country, for all of uh, the world. So you can find those in Africa, India, or Far East. And you can also find out how many ophthalmologists they have per population. It's not a mystery. I won't go into the definition of blindness, but basically blindness if you're below 2,400. And then you have the uh, uh, vision impairment uh, classifications. But in the Americas, at this point in time, we have 3 million people blind. Half of them from cataracts. That means we have a million and a half cataracts need to be done. And in the low vision area, we have 23. These are visually impaired. So the task is still not done. There's a lot to be done, and, and I think the creation of the new students is the critical thing. So we need to create blindness prevention programs. Fortunately, the United States started with this mainly 40, 50 years ago. 
uh, right after the war. So they, you have in place statistics that tell you that each state how many cataracts probably need to be, uh, need to be done in order to prevent the accumulation or the backlog on cataracts. We're not that fortunate in the Americas. A typical RAP study, which is rapid assessment of abortable blindness, has 64% of the cataracts in patients that are older than 50 with vision less than 2400. So they're bilateral, meaning that they, both eyes need to be done. This is complicated by the development of different age structures. And what is happening is in the developed countries, you get more people to get to an older age. They become more vertical. In the uh, developing world, it's a wide base, a lot of young people, and very few make it to the old age. But as you get to the older, guess what? You get more cataracts and you get more diabetes. You get more glaucoma. So as we get older, we're more likely to get these diseases, something that in, unfortunately the insurance companies have worked out and now they don't want to have coverage for anything after the age of 60 because that's when they know things are going to happen. The number of ophthalmologists per population is in this slide. As you can see, again, Argentina is the leading uh, uh, actor in that res uh, respect, followed by Uruguay and Brazil. In the Dominican Republic, we are at about 30 ophthalmologists per million population. The ideal is not so much that you have ophthalmologists as much as you have ophthalmologists that are operating, that are able to do this cataract surgery. So you can see that in Brazil, the efforts to increase the cataract surgery rate were very successful. Brazil, for almost 15 years, lowered the residency training programs to two years. And they would not allow any foreigners to get in there either, because they needed to build up their human uh, resources in order to build up their cataract surgery uh, rate. So counting the ophthalmologist is not enough. I get into this problem all the time with my colleagues at home, and they say, you're training too many doctors until their daughter or their son needs to go to training. And they say, you know what, I told you wrong. I think you know, she's a good candidate or he's a good candidate. You ought to consider her. But then you need to have them trained not only to do consultation and, uh, and the refraction, they need to be able to operate. And this is something that we're against the World Health Authorities because for them, prevention of blindness is not a priority. For them, maternal health, HIV, uh, water, treatment, uh, having potable water, uh, malaria, rabies, and all these other programs are way before the prevention of blindness. And we're like category number 15 in the Dominican Republic, which has been a problem for us in dealing with that. And they're right in a sense because if there are the ABCs of health and you have to immunize the children and you have to have these vaccination programs and prevention for HIV and uh, high cost treatment for uh, these medications and so forth. As an example, Haiti has a free obstetrics care program now. And the French government offered to build them three new hospitals where they, get, uh, they could go for free maternity care. But they prefer going over the border of the Dominican Republic where it's also totally free and they get a Dominican passport and then we are faced with a problem where the Haitians come without any prenatal data whatsoever making the complication rate much higher. And these are the uh, things that we're facing, but you know how we're gonna get over them? The only way to get over them is by education. In all, in all respects, not only in ophthalmology, but in all of healthcare. Then comes the economic question, how much does it cost? Van Lansing published his paper in the American Journal as well. He did an estimate of how much it would cost to have a population with blindness calculating how much they would make, how much it costs to keep them as a blind person, how much income they uh, uh, lack, and also the helpers that have to take care of the blind person, how much that costs to the people in the country. And uh, this had to do with the percentage of the population that was over the age of 60, which, and he had the data on how many were blind from cataracts. It, it came up to this roaring statistic of $28.3 billion to keep the blind in Latin America. So you would think somebody would be smart enough to do something about it. In the labs, we found that the cataract uh, was the most common cause of blindness, and it's in Espanol, but basically, they didn't know they had cataracts, or they didn't know there was a cure for the cataract, or they were too old and felt that getting old and being blind was equal and they weren't worried about it. They couldn't afford it, or there was not something available to them. Travel was too far or inconvenient for them to get the uh, surgery. So these are what we call the barriers. And the barriers, by the way, in that barrel that I showed you at the beginning is what makes the barrel go up or down. As you have more barriers, 
the bottom stratus of the bell is very small and the upper one is higher. As your barriers get eliminated, as they are in many of the better developed countries, well, hardly anybody has a cataract that doesn't get done. And if you're in Florida or California, you don't even need to get the cataract. You get it done before it even shows up. So now going into the uh, aspect of uh, complications and the quality of cataract surgery, because you can have a cataract operation and have a capsular opacification, uh, say, two, three years later, and you're back to being blind again. So there has to be a form of guaranteeing the quality of these services. And we heard it from uh, Jacob yesterday about how carefully they choose their patients and how they do away with things that are inappropriate, meaning if they get infected, they have trachoma or diverted eyelid or have that problems. And I'm showing you a picture that I went on this mercy ship in the uh, Amazon River of Peru. We started out in, in Iquitos, and we would do a surgery, and the most... The surgery was easy. The hard part was sitting down because they had to put four chairs up in the air and they were made out of plastic and that was my stool. And of course the bed was in the water so it was moved from one side to the other. Fortunately the patient moved with you. But it made the surgery a little bit difficult. And we would do anywhere between 15 and 20 operations in during the day and then we'd get on the boat and move upstream somewhere else. Uh, next morning we would anchor and and so I'm going to what we do. And in the rab that was done in the DR, they stratified them into those that got the surgery in the government hospitals, they got it in the teaching hospitals like mine that were NGOs and charity, private practice, and then when the mission clinics would come along. And of course the mission clinics got the red, and mind you, I didn't do the survey, so. But the, the prob problem when the mission leaves is that many of these patients are left without any post-operative care because it's very difficult to get them, and the uh, local ophthalmologist complains. So always when you go on a mission, arrange it so somebody will be able to follow these patients, particularly if they get into trouble. Coverage of the population, how many receive the care? This is called coverage, and it's a formula where you add how many people are blind with cataracts. And then on top, you say how many actually got cured uh, from cataract surgery. And that gives you the coverage rate. And uh, as you can see, in the DR, only half of the people are, are, that are blind are getting the, uh, the cataract surgery. And in the visually impaired, it's even worse. So it's, that's not those that are already blind. Actually, if you do them earlier, you prevent them from going into the blind uh, stud. Fortunately, now most countries in Latin America are using the IOL. So 94.2% of the patients that got operated in the DR uh, actually get an IOL. And it's the exception is getting the IOL. And this is way much better than the days when we were doing intercaps with adult silk sutures and aphagic spectacles and the people were just as blind after surgery. So here comes the problem of self-assessment, and you're actually being uh, aware that you are not perfect. And you have to be doing this constantly in the institutions that are doing prevention of blindness. Did you get an endophthalmitis? Did you get a septic lens rupture of the capsule? Did you have a diabetic with macular edema? The hole was there, detached from atrophy. And then what's the way to do that is by avoiding it. You just carefully examine them before you operate on them. And I always tell my residents, don't operate on somebody else's patient if you don't know them. Go and check the patient that same day. Make sure you're that you look for all these uh, possibilities and when you have excluded them. And the greatest one is the uh, Gutata. They say, oh, now patient looks clear and match mature cataract. And you go in and what are you going to do, a fake? Like, oh, yeah, with, with 800 cells in the, in the ceiling, are you going to do a fake? There's not going to be any cornea left by the time you're over. Or maybe they have a macular hole, or maybe they have a retinal detachment or optic atrophy that was not detached. So you have to be looking for all these possibilities in the preoperative management of these patients, because the worst thing is to offer them the, ex the expectation that they're going to see better and then uh, quit. Is that five minutes? Oh, I'm doing great. So finally, <laughs> so finally we have appropriate technology. And uh, had I know I had five minutes, I would put more videos in here. We have two roles, one of the FACO and the other one of the manual uh, extra cap or, M or small incision cataract surgery. And the FACO has a much faster recovery time, and the patients that get the FACO are more likely to tell me, Doc, do, me, do my other eye right away, tomorrow if you want to, or the next week. And M6, they do, they do fine, and, but they're less likely to get the cataract uh, done the day after, maybe the week after. 
uh, they'll go through uh, with it. You get more astigmatism in the M6 than you do with the phaco, but you're more likely to burn the cornea, especially in the very mature cataracts with the phaco. So you have to be wise. And I still, to this day, in private practice, will opt for M6 over phaco. Because if I have a black lens and a compromised endothelium in a narrow chamber, and I can do the M6 just as well as I can do the phaco, I'd rather do the M6. It's quicker and I have less trouble with it. But I know that I get better optical results, with, especially if you're going to have a premium lens, you're going to be wanting to do the... Uh, the phaco emulsification. So phaco versus manual in our hospital switched in the year 2000, 2001, 2002. Right around that time, the two curves crossed. And the reason it's important is because when we started doing phaco, then we started being able to do combined phaco with trabeculectomy, which happens to be, as I mentioned, the number one cause of, of uh, having a visit at our hospital. Because it's very hard to do the combined uh, when you're doing a, um, uh, an M6 or an extra cap, because the blood simply fails, but not when you're doing the phaco emulsification, because we go temporarily with the phaco and superiorly with the uh, um, uh, trabeculectomy. And we always use mitomycin C, and now with the advent of the new uh, techniques, particularly the in-focus microshunt, that I'll try to show you tonight, it, it, it makes a big difference. So I'm, t I'm tapering down now. There's a beautiful quote from, uh, from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians 4.4. But in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But there are those that actually do have that vision, and I'm glad to be in a room where we have that, what uh, Steve Petty calls the enlightened vision. And having that enlightened vision is not new to us. I'm grateful to those that were my mentors and for those that continue to mentor me in what we do. Thank you very much.